going to give the first talk on the breaking inception of unsteady wave packets in the presence of constant vorticity. Please, Michael. Uh, it's a great pleasure to actually be back at the uh, B Waves Forum. My last uh, shot at it was uh, several years ago in Bergen, I think it was 2016, where this work was hatched with Julian Taboul. And I was looking for some diversity in the uh, kind of flow fields to test some, uh, some new ideas about uh, breaking onset. And uh, just uh, some of you will be familiar with the introductory part of this talk, but maybe the newcomers won't. So I've packed a bit of the background into, into this as well. Well, natural gravity water waves as opposed to academic water waves, uh, they have a spectral bandwidth which leads to an associated unsteadiness and modulation, group modulation. And in fact, we've learned that unsteady wave packets exhibit more degrees of freedom than uniform wave trains with particular uh, phenomena, crest slowdown and crest leaning. And I really believe that these aspects have enhanced our fundamental understanding of properties of two-dimensional and three-dimensional breaking waves. And amongst those phenomena that have been observed but not really understood were 20% apparent reduction of the speed of white caps compared with the nominal phase speed of the underlying wave that supports the breaker. And so that, that's kind of uh, pretty interesting because uh, normally people thought that the uh, the white cap speed matched the speed of the wave, which is assumed to be the, uh, the face speed of the wave. And so that was uh, puzzling for a little while. So that initiated uh, some of the uh, initial work. And for that, uh, for this introduction, I'm just gonna need to introduce a slightly more refined definition of local wave crest steepness because of the uh, strange shapes that some of the waves in modulating packets can assume, and uh, the differential, differentiation between crest steepness and the overall steepness uh, AK, which is usually ascribed. So all it is, it's not very fancy. The uh, parameter which I use is SC, and it's just the zero to maximum height, straight up. Uh, we ignore the tilt in this wave and we just take that A, we take the zero crossing separation, that's called lambda C for no good reason. And the, this uh, crest steepness is this construct and it's related to AK. AK in Stokes theory comes out to 0 0.0, sorry, 0 0.43 or whatever it is, maximum and at roughly at that uh, limit, this uh, SC parameter is about order point seven. So don't get alarmed if you see st steepnesses uh, beyond the point four three. It's because of this construct. Well, the interesting uh, stuff we learned a little while back was when you push a packet, uh, an evolving packet. It's called a chirped packet. I'll show you the mathematical form for it in due course. Uh, you get uh, this kind of motion. It's a, this is a, a time stack that way, spatial out this way. And we just focus our attention on this growing uh, crest in here, this little roguey looking thing. And the sequence that I just want to focus on is the uh, locations A, B, C, D, E, C being at the maximum of the crest evolution there. And if we uh, plat, put these uh, line plots in, in this simple array here with horizontal distance X and bottom, uh, the elevation up here and time running, uh, obviously runs from A, B, C, D, it's running down the page. Uh, what you notice is these uh, leaning and uh, in the middle of the sequence of the maximum, you see this from the forward leaning crest, very diff very clear differential between the slopes for front and back. Uh, 
it's steepening and still tilting, doing other interesting things. In the middle of the, of the uh, evolution, it's approximately symmetrical, almost has a Stokes-like behavior uh, appearance. And then as it uh, goes over the top and starts to decrease as it passes through the envelope maximum, uh, it, the, the leaning is now backwards and then it, it uh, basically devolves from being the top and the, the next wave in the packet uh, rises or the packet uh, fades. Anyway, the interesting thing, oops, then is that uh, when you have a look at the speed of the crest as it's progressing, and you put it on a time plot. I'm just going to move this jump away from my, my screen. Um, again, same plot, horizontal uh, distance that away, horizontal and time upward. You actually see that there are different, uh, th these are the, uh, the locus of the crests and it seems to be going at the speed around A and then the speed slows down going from between A and B, and we get up to around D. And so there's a change in speed as the uh, you go through the maximum, and then it resumes its former speed. And so that's actually pretty interesting. So this is what you, you, you kind of see as the crest slowing down and then speeding up again as it goes through this uh, evolution through the maximum. And when you do something a little, a little bit more formal, if you plot the crest speed relative to the nominal face speed of the wave or the zero crossing speeds, then what you see is a little bit messy here because it's actually there's some complex stuff going on uh, in this in this wave packet. So there's a small uh, discontinuity as it looks for the next uh, peak. There's a, a, sm a small version of what you see on the forward face there up in there in that region there. It's not very visible, but that's the cause of this little spike. But nevertheless, what you see is A, B, C, D, E. So you can see very clearly that the uh, as the uh, wave builds up and this crest steepness builds up, when you get to the maximum of the crest steepness, you end up with a minimum of the crest speed and it's of order 0.8 of the nominal speed of the wave, nominal face speed of the wave. Well, this is in fact a generic property of modulating waves, and it's a uh, it's it's not a nonlinear effect at all. It's a it's a linear effect. It's due to the bandwidth of the waves, and it's uh, it's really there. And just for reference. If this were was a academic Stokes wave, in other words, periodic domain, maximum steepness is of order, in, in terms of SC, is of order somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7, as I pointed out before. And you can see the Stokes wave is about, you know, I think it's 12% faster, the maximum steepness Stokes wave, whereas this is 20% slower. So that's pretty amazing. And that actually, explains why white caps seem to be traveling about 20% slower than the parent wave. Well, that's kind of a nice, a nice reconciliation of something that was discovered in the, uh, you know, in the, in the 1980s, I, I believe, but yet not resolved. All right, well, moving on. I just included this, uh, this is the uh, manifestation of it in, in nature. And this is a, uh, it's a long paper that we've uh, written. This is the uh, Fidelity et al. JFM paper, looking at this crest slowdown effect and why it's there and what, what you know, the, the, uh, the properties of it. And, uh, but one nice little snippet is, this is a piece of the ocean. We're magnifying this wave here in space time and these are the, uh, the crest tracking contours. And on the, uh, on, on the uh, well, time is progressing up the page. And this is the spatial propagation. 
what you see is there's a different slope and a different front back steepness at uh, this end of the evolution. And you can see then it merges into a, uh, this, this, is, this is the slowdown part. And then these, this is less distance over the same time. And this is more distance over the same time. So this wave where the, uh, the thing has reversed itself so that the, uh, the rear face is steeper than the forward face and uh, the thing is speeding up. So we're at the exit end of the, of the cycle there. And to make it even more graphic, this is about a half an hour of video record where we tracked every packet that we could identify. This is uh, Franco's masterful skills at this data analysis. And uh, what you see here is the probability density function for the crest speed relative to the nominal phase speed of the packet and uh, of the, of the um, carrier waves in the packet. And so what this is showing is a, a all, all steepnesses and the peak of that is around 0.75. And for the uh, uh, higher waves in, in the uh, ensemble, taller waves, the taller waves uh, where the SC is greater than 0 0.2. So, I mean, they're weakly nonlinear to moderately nonlinear and above. The, uh, in fact, the, the slowdown is, is uh, measurably less. And this has to do with the <clears throat> the, the um, complexity of the uh, slowdown mechanism as the nonlinearity affects the dispersion. So that's kind of a, uh, it's, a <laughs> it's a reality check that we're not uh, looking at something too esoteric that doesn't exist. Right now, um, I'll just get down my page. So what I'm gonna need to move on is um, the basis of our inception, breaking inception uh, parameter. Now, what we, what we actually have developed in this little summary that I'm gonna give is a parameter which we claim will separate any wave crest, every wave crest that is gonna go and break from those that are not going to break. They will grow, but they won't pass what we believe is a generic threshold. So how do we figure this out? Well, it was very intuitive, as you'll see. Okay, so we need the energy density, which is the potential energy and the kinetic energy as a local field variable. And we need the same thing, but with the energy flux, which is the uh, flux of the energy in the interior. These things all exist on the surface. And the intuitive uh, in, in, initial thinking was that, um, you know, the waves break at the crest at the tip. And so it might be natural to compare the local crest tip energy flux speed, which is given by uh, the local energy flux divided by the local energy density. And we want to compare that with the local crest tip speed, which is the speed of the crest. So we've got the fluid speed, which is also oh, the energy, uh, the energy transport speed of the fluid, which you'll see in a minute turns out to be the fluid velocity in the crest over the local crest tip speed, which now we recognize has some nonlinearity, it has, sorry, has some non-stationarity to it, and it has uh, certainly some uh, uh, variability due to this crest leaning and crest slowdown business. So we're not comparing it to the phase speed, we're comparing it to the dynamically changing crest tip speed. Okay, so we're just gonna define a very innocent looking parameter. It's just the ratio of the, uh, this energy flux velocity F over E, mod F over E because F is a vector of course, uh, and we're gonna divide it, normalize it by the crest speed, CC, following the crest tip. And 
pretty pretty uh, simply on the free surface, which is assumed constant, P0 is just a reference, arbitrary reference constant anyway. So we can uh, take this whole thing in here to be zero and without losing any generality because a, uh, uh, a constant pressure field through the whole fluid uh, makes no difference to the dynamics. So uh, along the free surface then, Vx just reduces to the speed of the fluid divided by this fluctuating or this is dynamically changing press speed. And because it's essentially uh, horizontal things that we're looking at, we uh, call this thing Vx. And you, we did look at how much uh, vertical uh, componentry was in there and it was, it was uh, negligibly small. So the only thing to mention beyond that is that this uh, energetically motivated parameter reduces to something that we're almost familiar with, and that's the, uh, the, the classical kinematic braking condition U over C, where C was always taken as the, uh, or almost always taken as the phase speed of the wave. So, uh, oops, hang on. All right, so, what we did was the following, and I'm just reading it because I don't know how to do it any other way. We track the behavior of this BX parameter following any given wave crest. And you can do it for nonlinear 2D packets, you do it for 3D packets, and we, that's what we did originally. And we looked at deep water wave packets, we looked at in, in sorry, wave packets in deep water, in deep water, and we did some intermediate water with constant depth and the original paper was in uh, 218 and what we did was the, uh, the the looking at the difference between the maximum waves that didn't break and the the next uh, quantum of, of uh, any over overdriving the wave so that it just broke i call that marginal breaking so we look at the maximum, let's call it recurrent wave, that means non-breaking, and we looked at the, uh, you know, the, the marginal breaking one with the weakest signature of breaking, judged by a, an overturning crest, which forms some kind of a vertical uh, local tangent of the forward face. And we, we obviously couldn't pick it in advance, so we had to do a whole sequence of uh, amplitudes, initial amplitudes of the wave packet in order to uh, come up with, with a, uh, an ensemble of cases. And then we had to play around, make sure that the uh, particular wave packet we chose uh, didn't have anything special. So we, we had a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of waves, a lot of packets. Anyway, further subsequent studies have in fact reinforced the generic nature that this threshold uh, revealed through these numerical simulations. And then we did parallel experiments in the lab and uh, quite a few other groups joined in, probably stimulated by the last B waves thing in, in, uh, in November and beyond. And those have included more adventurous things such as flowing up slope shorelines, etc and uh, over sandbars. These studies have all supported the BX robust inception threshold of 0.855 with a very small error bar around it. So let's say 0.85 to 0.86-ish. So that's pretty amazing because this is, now what's this inception? Inception means a bifurcation point where if it's going to go break, that's where the wave crest knows, that's when it knows it's irreversibly headed to, towards breaking. And the breaking, which we'll call the physical manifestation where you can see it, is called the onset. And that will occur after this inception threshold. At the inception threshold, 
you really can't tell because there's nothing glaringly there in the in the surface. You can't tell. All right. So, how long have I been talking, uh, Henrik? So uh, actually, so you're just at the at the twenty minute mark now. So if you could um, just okay, spend so a few more minutes. I, I, I I'm on to the um, the constant vorticity shear current now. So this is actually in a JFM paper that's in in, in uh, this year, but essentially I've summarised it and I just show you the pictures. So we wanted to do something with uh, a bit more challenge where things weren't in the uh, usual zero current situation. So what we've done is we've added a, in the second line here, uh, a linear shear current where the shear strength is the, uh, is the vorticity and it's uniform, it's constant. And we've used just the Euler equations and, sorry, the Euler equations and uh, We've added the appropriate boundary conditions, initial conditions. You need a stream function in there to manage the uh, uh, the current, and full details are in this Tabul and Banner paper. Now, I I'll just move on to the results. Sorry, where's my Okay, so we did a lot of cases. We did deep water cases, intermediate depth, and the S is the shear. It ran from minus one to plus one. Zero means no shear. And the packet that we put in is, is a chirp packet. So what this is, a, is a, an amplitude. This is a ramping up of the, uh, the, the uh, leading Front edge of the, of the packet. This is the fall of the at the back of the packet of the group, and this is the uh, carrier, which is a uh, a set of frequency with with a dependence on time. And a chirp means you are stretching the the frequencies, and that's done with this quadratic chirp factor, and that produces something like we saw in the in the picture that I showed you before with the crest slowdown is exactly the same one. And so the details are in the uh, are in the paper. Now, when I say what we're doing, we, we are chasing the, uh, th this parameter B as the crest evolves. We're doing it computationally and we are compiling the time history. So this is time across here. And this is the variation of Bx. This is the 0.855 threshold. And in these three cases, the blue one being blue, sorry, the, the blue one is uh, zero shear or zero vorticity. This is positive vorticity and the green one is, uh, sorry, the green one is positive and the red one is negative. So you can see that this, these uh, do not attain the thing. So these are recurrent wave crests. All right, the other things that come up, we see with the uh, hysteresis of the crest speed variation, we see the same thing as we saw uh, for the zero shear, as we do for these two cases with a minus 0.5 and a plus 0.5 shear. Let me say this, this is not written here. If, if you have S of this order, this means that at the at the crest level, the shear velocity approximates that orbital velocity, orbital speed of the wave. So it's it's of that order. It's not super strong, but it's not super weak. So we're getting the same effect there. On the next slide, this is the evolution of all those cases. If you just focus on the deep water case, on the bottom. This is the increasing the, the, uh, the crest steepness uh, and it goes up to the Stokes limit. And on the vertical axis, you've got this VX parameter for every crest in every packet. So we tracked every crest and every packet and the open symbols, all the open symbols are non-breaking crests and the solid crests, 
the, the ones that are broken, they've actually gone fully through and there's a, as a signature of the overturning of the tip where there's a vertical tangent. And you can see in both scenarios that all these cases are breaking and the two classes are separated by the, uh, this parameter BX of about 0.855. And we've done the same thing for the intermediate depth case. And deep water is lambda is uh, the same as the depth. Intermediate depth is lambda is twice the depth. So that's a remarkable, remarkably robust result. Uh, there's no large gap between the two. In fact, this one's right on the, on the threshold. So this is the weakest one in this ensemble, but there are no breaking cases below and there are no non-breaking cases above. And the last figure is this one. If you just cast your eye down the center panel, this is uh, time, this is, a, sorry, this is, these, these are uh, the evolution in time of the crest. The middle one is S equals zero. And you can see the, uh, the tip of the crest forming this uh, vertical tangent and then proceeding to go over. This is breaking in the familiar fashion forwardly. When you put the positive shear, positive shear, uh, it augments the orbital, the, the uh, orbital velocity of the wave, and it uh, it accelerates the uh, you know the, the the wave breaking in a sense. It's favourable for it, and but the, it much looks much the same. But this is the extremely interesting case where the the crest does not really show this kind of typical signature of an overturning wave as we see in these other two panels. And in fact, the breaking proceeds by a, uh, an eruption, a disruption of the surface of the crest. And it's some small ejection of fluid here, uh, almost rearward. So that is pretty remarkable, but these minus 0.5 cases are amongst those included in this ensemble back over here, there's, there's minus 0.5 cases or sitting in, in this lot here. I can't tell you exactly which ones they are. You've got to look at the colors. So the, uh, the moral of the story then is a present shear layer results, then I've called it moderate vorticity in the sense that I said before, uh, they confirm that the uh, breaking inception continues to occur at the, uh, let's call it, this, the, the, the aspiring generic threshold of 0.855, inception threshold. And that conforms to the, uh, the one that I was discussing before, the original ones that didn't have any under, underlying currents. Uh, we noticed that this uh, threshold is operative earlier than the historically advocated kinematic criterion, which was that you, the fluid velocity, exceeds the, the crest speed, not the crest speed. They took it as the, uh, uh, usually took it as the phase speed. Some refinement was, was uh, people got a bit uh, cranky with it. And so they, uh, they looked a bit more closely and were getting the message about the, something that should be related to the crest rather than the phase speed. And, but the thing is, they only found out about braking once the braking had started. So it's not really a predictor. Remember our criterion cuts in, not when U over C is one, but when U over C is 0.86, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's measurably lower than one. So this uh, linear shear study extends our confidence and uh, we did it only for two depths, two depth conditions. We did it for uh, two different, uh, wave packet geometries, but lots of different steepnesses in there. And uh, it really is emphasizing that breaking inception is not, in, is not controlled by wave steepness nor crest geometry. There's some 
something intimately linked to the energetics and further study seems to be warranted to look at the validity in more complex sharing cases and you know many other weight breaking scenarios my deep apologies for running over but i was trying to uh, get over a lot of history for the uh, the newcomers to the to the talk i mean to the 